Uh, hopefully I'll do equally well here. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be uh, invited uh, to speak in front of physics teachers. As uh, George said, you know, I think my uh, interest in physics and love of physics was kindled by a my high school physics teacher. So I'm going to talk to you today about um, a really remarkable and amazing discovery uh, that took place uh, on September 14th, and then again on December 26th of last year, the, the discovery of gravitational waves from LIGO, from, from two black holes uh, uh, colliding and merging together. And it's really a, a remarkable story. And the story goes back really uh, about 100 years ago, a little over 100 years ago. So I want to start this by giving you a little bit of background uh, on gravity, general relativity, and, and uh, gravitational waves. So, this is my favorite picture of Albert Einstein. It shows that he's a bit of a, a, a comic. Uh, this paper is the seminal paper that Einstein wrote in uh, 2015, where he uh, basically turned the world of gravity on its head by coming up with a theory of gravity that no longer needed action at a distance, uh, Newtonian gravity, but explained it in terms of something called geometry. And I'm, and I'm going to have a few equations in my presentation. The first one is what I'll call the equation. It's the Einstein field equations. This is what comes out of Einstein's theory of, of general relativity. And, and I have to apologize. It's just convention that we use g mu nu on the left-hand side of the equation and g, the gravitational constant, on the right-hand side of the equation. They're not, they're not the same thing. Uh, nevertheless, this equation is, is everything that general relativity tells us about uh, gravity. It predicts things such as black holes. Uh, it explains time, uh, time dilation in gravitational fields. Uh, it, it predicts the gravitation like you know, most physical uh, fundamental forces propagate at the speed of light. And it was a, a remarkable paradigm shifting experiment. All right. Um, the equation, I'm an experimentalist, uh, you know, I've, I have played with these equations in the distant past, but mostly I build equipment. And, and to me, this is what that equation says. It has two parts to it. On the left-hand side, it has that quantity g mu nu, which is space and time. And in Einstein's special theory of relativity, they're, they're put together, in the general theory, they're not only put together, but they're equated with the right-hand side of the equation, that quantity t mu nu, which is matter and energy. And then there's something uh, in, uh, that links them, in, and that's a coupling constant. So you can think, and very crudely, it's not a perfect analogy, but you can think of this equation really as a, a, as a, as a, a, a law that relates uh, a force to, to curva, uh, space to curvature. And there's a constant, and that constant is 8 pi g uh, over c to the fourth. Now, if most, you're all physics teachers, so you can all probably calculate this uh, in your head. Uh, 8 pi g over c to the fourth, c is of course a very large number, g is a very small number, g over c to the fourth is a very, very small number. It's about two times 10 to the minus 43, forgetting about the units. I know we all care about units, but for purposes of dimensionality here, let's 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 not worry about let's not worry about the units. The point I'm trying to make here is if you go back to this equation, it says that space and time and matter and energy are coupled, but they're coupled very, very weakly. And that coupling constant, two times ten to the minus forty-three, means it takes a heck of a lot of matter of matter and energy, stress energy, to to change space and time, to curve space and time. And so the picture that, that I like to show, there are others that have different pictures, but I like to show is, is this picture, which is a picture of this, the Earth orbiting around the sun. And if you forget about that green grid on the bottom, all right, Newton would tell you that the force of gravity that holds the Earth in orbit is you know, proportional to the mass of the sun, it's proportional to the mass of the Earth, it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. It says nothing about how that force is communicated. Well, what Einstein does, what general relativity does, is it tells you how that force is communicated. Basically, that green grid below is a two-dimensional rendering. So in some sense, it's hard to render 3Ds on, on a graph. So it's a two-dimensional rendering of, of space-time. And where you have heavy masses, you warp the space. So, so the geometry is no longer Euclidean or Minkowskian in special relativity. It's now uh, uh, Riemannian, and, and the, 
the geometry depends very much on what the nature of the geometry of the object is that's warping it. And so why does this, the Earth orbit around the Sun? Well, in this case, the Earth orbits around the Sun not because there's some magic gravity force that's attracting them, pulling them together. It's because the Earth is following a natural path, all right? And that natural path in this warped space-time picture happens to be the, the, the straight lines in, in, in the Earth's view of geometry are actually in orbit around uh, that sun. So, so, so the take-home message here is that you know, space tells matter how to move and, and matter how, tells space how to curve. But again, I come back to that constant that's very, very tiny, and that's why it takes, it's taken 100 years for us to be able to, to measure this phenomenon of gravitational waves. Well, what is a gravitational wave? And I'll go into a lot more detail into this later on in the talk. But basically, if I have those two objects orbiting around one another, this is a nice rendering from a graphic artist at Caltech. All right, uh, th these are two black holes orbiting around another. And what they're doing as they orbit around one another is they're, they're putting out ripples in space-time. So any accelerating object, any accelerating object that has mass all right, is producing a, a gravitational wave. Again, the challenge is that the amplitude of those gravitational waves is very tiny. Okay, so uh, as an experimentalist, we want to measure stuff. Uh, uh, so what, what are we actually measuring? Well, the amplitude of those gravitational waves, they are propagating, uh, um, basically they're propagating solutions of Einstein's equations. Uh, they're, you know, they're spherically propagating outward. The amplitude of the wave falls off as one over the distance, not one over the distance squared. That's actually very important for us, and it makes our jobs much easier. All right, but physically, the amplitude is a change in length per unit length. All right, so so delta L over L. That's the quant. That's a strain. It's a common, uh, pretty common concept in physics. So what's happening as these gravitational wave passes? As a gravitational wave passes you. All right, so suppose a gravitational wave is coming out of the board and it's coming towards you. There are two polarizations of the waves, and I show them both here. What it's doing is it's stretching space in one dimension, perpendicular to the propagation direction. It's compressing space in the other direction at the same time, and then this just continues as, as a full cycle of the gravitational wave uh, passes. For the experts in the audience, um, these are uh, basically quadrupole source, so they're not sourced by uh, dipoles like uh, electromagnetic rays. Okay, so, so the key here is that if you look at a point, and hopefully my laser will work, I'm looking at this side over here. If you look at a point close to where, and you, you pick an arbitrary reference point, it doesn't matter where you are, any, any arbitrary reference point, you're going to see this effect. Right? If you pick a point close to that arbitrary reference point, all right, Obviously, the delta L or L is very small, but if I go further and further and further away to the edges of those black lines, you can see that the delta L over L is very big. I'm greatly, greatly, greatly exaggerating the size of the effect here. It's, it's, very, it's very, very tiny. But it, but it does tell you something. It tells you that if you want to try and measure these things, all right, you need to do two things. You need to be able to measure delta L very precisely and you want to do it over as long a baseline as possible. Okay, so now let me come to the challenge. How do we make a gravitational wave? This is a picture that I took out of a Hollywood sci-fi movie in the 50s, uh, but it really uh, does uh, uh, sort of exhibit what, how you would try and do this in a laboratory. So this is a mad scientist. Uh, he's calculated what the size of the effect is, and he says, okay, I'm going to take two uh, uh, masses, each of about uh, 1,000 kilograms. I'm going to separate them by about a meter or so, uh, and I'm going to spin them around at 1,000 times a second. So I wouldn't urge you to encourage your students to try this experiment. Uh, he's smart enough that he gets out of the lab and actually goes far away. Uh, if you do, if you run the numbers, uh, you come up with a number that's 10 to the minus 35. All right, and if you're an experimentalist, that's a daunting number, and you just sort of fold up shop, walk away, and do something else. Um, but then you realize, and this is really, I think, one of the one of the inspiring parts of this uh, uh, field is that about 50 years ago. A uh, gentleman named Joe Weber at the University of Maryland decided that he thought he might be able to measure gravitational waves, not from laboratory experiments, but from astrophysical sources, from supernova, or in this case, perhaps a binary neutron star merging together. 
And that wasn't a bad bet, actually. Uh, it turns out Weber, Weber used a technology known as a bar technology, uh, which I won't get into, but uh, he wasn't successful. But he got people thinking about how you might measure a gravitational wave and use it to say something about the nature of the universe. So you do that same calculation for this particular source. These are two neutron stars. This is a canonical source for LIGO. This is, in fact, what I thought we would see first when we turned on our detectors and detected something. Two neutron stars. They're each about 1.4 solar masses. Uh, they're very compact objects. Their diameters are about 20, 25 kilometers or so. And they're orbiting around one another. And now they're orbiting around one another very rapidly. These guys are uh, uh, also orbiting around one another at about a kilohertz. Uh, uh, with an appreciable fraction of the speed of, of light, maybe about a third of the speed of light. And the same calculation takes you to 10 to the minus 21, which is still an awful small number, but it's a number that if you start to think seriously about how you would try and detect gravitational waves, you think to yourself, yeah, if I understand all the ways I can you know, minimize uh, uh, my, my noises for measuring delta L and measure over a big enough baseline, I can get there. I can do it. And in fact, that's what happened in the 70s. Uh, a, colleague, a colleague of mine at Caltech, Kip Thorne, started thinking seriously about this. And he uh, started having serious conversations with uh, Rainer Weiss, who at the time was a professor of physics at MIT. And, and they, this was in the 70s. And they started thinking about this uh, in the 70s. And they realized that you could use something called an interferometer. To, to measure it, and, and, and that was really a bold vision. More importantly, they were able to sell that vision to the National Science Foundation and get the National Science Foundation to, uh, to fund the research. And it took a long time, and I'll tell an anecdote at the end of the, the talk here about how long people thought it would take. So, all right, so this is a hint of where I think this field is really going and why it's so important. All right. What do we know about the universe? Well, we know, we know a lot about the universe. The reason we know a lot about the universe is because we have developed a lot of tools over the last hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, to, uh, in this case, hundreds of years, to, to, to look at the fundamental universe. We, have, we look at them through photons, through gamma rays, x-rays, optical. Uh, we look at them through the collision of subatomic particles, such as the LHC at CERN. Uh, we use neutrinos, uh, which are, are very good uh, messengers of information out of, say, supernova. Uh, and we also look at cosmic rays. All right. So this is basically everything we know about the universe comes from some formulation of that. Of course, we have microscopes and we have lasers and things like that. These are other tools. But, but basically, the probes of the fundamental universe sort of can, can be encapsulated on that slide there. OK, so that's why this is, is really important. And I'll come back at the end of the talk and tell you how I think this field is really going to take off in the, next, in the next 10 to 20 years. So now let me talk about LIGO. And, and LIGO is the thing that, that Kip and Ray got started about uh, 40 years ago. And it's since uh, it's grown into a, a very large endeavor. And so what I'm going to do in this section of the talk is talk a little bit about the interferometry, how you can think about making a device that can measure something that's 10 to the minus 21 in strain. All right, let me, let me start with the basics. Uh, the laboratory, which I am part of, uh, is operated by Caltech and MIT. We've been running LIGO for the past uh, almost 30 years. Now, uh, again, I always point out that uh, it's really the funding agencies and the fact that the National Science Foundation funds this cutting edge research that we can do this. Um, we are two observatories. One is in Hanford, Washington, uh, uh, in the sort of the southeastern corner of Washington. The other is in L uh, Livingston, Louisiana, not too far from Baton Rouge. Uh, and again, there are bases of operations. I'm at Caltech, uh, and there are also, there's also a very uh, large group of, of scientists and engineers at MIT. All right. This, OK, so that's where we are. This just sort of gives you a sense of scale. And I really like this movie. This is the Hanford. Uh, this is Hanford. The one before was Livingston. Uh, you can sort of get a sense of how big these interferometers are. And you can also get a sense that we put them in completely different parts of the world. Uh, that's a vacuum tube. The entire observatory is evacuated. We have a tremendous amount of lasers and optics that go into to making these precise measurements. A big control room. You see a couple of graduate students there. Uh, these are scientists and graduate students that are sitting there trying to figure out how, why something isn't working in the interferometer, which is uh, not, not, not uh, uncommon. These are very complicated, very complicated devices. The point of, of that last picture, I think, is a very important point that um, 
takes a lot of people to make this work, and, and the, the, the group of people that constitute the LIGO scientific collaboration, which is not just Caltech and MIT, it's a large, large group of people, uh, numbers at about 1,000 people. So this is big science, but it's big science that works very well. And I put this slide up here not to uh, have you read your, your logo, although your logo might actually be on there, because I think there are 80 of them. But it shows the breadth of the collaboration. So, so we have institutions such as Northwestern University, my alma mater. Uh, University of Texas at some point was involved in it, also my alma mater. But we also have institutions like Fullerton, all right, which is a, you know, a, a smaller school. We have institutions like Andrews University in, in Michigan. So uh, it's, it's a very broad collaboration where uh, anybody who's interested in working and, and making a contribution to the mission of LIGO can join and, and come in. And so we're an open collaboration. We're very, very proud of that. Uh, let me now turn to interferometry. So um, this may be a little simplistic for this crowd, but I like it because it really is a nice uh, demonstration of how LIGO interferometry works. So, so this is the most basic interferometer you can think of. Uh, it's a Michelson interferometer. That cylinder is the laser. That uh, uh, object in the center is a beam splitter. Uh, it basically divides the, the light beam in two. The two black circles uh, in, in the far part of the diagram are mirrors, uh, and that uh, uh, square that you, uh, you you'll, you'll see more of later on is the uh, photodiode. So it's the thing, in some sense, that records the signal. So, so why is interferometry such a great way of doing, of measuring things like this? And the answer is, is because interferometry has light in it, and it has laser light, and laser light has wavelengths, and, and wavelengths of light are the most precise rulers in the world. So what happens here? is you know, we send the beam out, it splits in two ways, we've color coded them so you can see. Uh, we configure the interferometer so that no light gets back to that photo detector uh, sitting there on the, on the right hand side of the screen. Then a gravitational wave passes and it's going to wiggle those mirrors, but you know, and again, this is greatly, greatly exaggerated. And of course, we use the fact that you know, coherent light interferes destructively and, inter and, and uh, constructively. So as one cycle of the gravitational wave goes by, all right, we basically transduce. So that stretching and compressing of space-time, which basically changes the distance between the beam splitter and the two end mirrors, differentially in opposite senses, all right, is recorded by the time of flight of the laser beam that goes through the, that goes up down the, 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 the paths of the arms, and then is recorded and transduced, if you will. So, so what an interferometer is, is a transducer. It transduces gravitational waves into photocurrent, which you can then digitize and read out. All right, so, all right, that's the simplistic picture. I will say that, again, this is greatly exaggerated. The wavelengths of light that we use are about one micron. Uh, we split the fringe, in other words, we resolve the, the wavelengths to about 10 to the minus 12 or 10 to the minus 13 of that. And it turns out that you, you can do that, and the first thing that anybody asks when they get involved in LIGO is, how do you do it? And, and you sit down and you read a lot of paper about how noises interact with the interferometer, and you come to the conclusion that, yeah, you can, you can make it work. All right, so here's, here's the, some of the, the facts and figures. Here again is Livingston. So the arms are four kilometers long, so that's the L in the denominator. All right, so that requires you in the numerator, in the delta L, to measure something to about 10 to the minus 18 or 10 to the minus 19 meters. All right, so here's what LIGO really looks like conceptually, and this is, uh, 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 again, it's a cartoon, but it's a slightly uh, more sophisticated cartoon. Uh, uh, LIGO is a Michelson interferometer on steroids. Uh, so you recognize the laser, you recognize the beam splitter, you'll recognize the end test masses, laser, beam splitter, end test masses over there. We put some other mirrors into the system, and those other mirrors in the system actually help enhance the signal. And I won't go into the, the physics details. You can ask questions afterwards. But basically, we put uh, fabry perot cavities, which allows the light to stay in the interferometer longer. It effectively makes the light think that it's traveling much, much longer distances than it is. Uh, we put in power recycling uh, 
All the light, when the interferometer is in its quiet quiescent state, all the light comes back towards the laser. That's wasted. So we basically resonantly couple it back into the interferometer. And again, we can enhance the, the light power, enhance, reduce something called shot noise by about a factor of 40 or 50. Um, signal recycling mirror, this is a really interesting part of the interferometer. This allows us to tune the response of the interferometer. So it allows us basically to be able to tune into certain frequencies uh, or uh, just enhance overall the, the sensitivity of the interferometer. And then there's the sensing diode. And now you notice that, that there are little lines that connect up with the mirrors. And this is really important. One of the things that you have to do to make the interferometer work is you have to uncouple the mirrors from any disturbance whatsoever. Any disturbance whatsoever. In other words, in the direction that the, the gravitational wave is going to be stretching and compressing space-time, you want the effective force that comes about from the passing of the gravitational wave. And you can write the equations in such a way that it does show up as an effective force that is gravitationally changing. There's a gravitational potential change that pushes the mirror around. You want that to be bigger, larger than anything else. All right? And again, you've already seen how small this is. So, so the way we do this uh, is, is we, um, we suspend the mirrors. And I'll say more about that. In a minute, let me talk a little bit about. I'm, uh, as George said, I'm a, I'm, I started my career in lasers, so I, I spent a lot of time uh, working and thinking on the LIGO laser. This is a picture of the LIGO laser system. Uh, um, there are two things to take home from from this. One, this is not your grandfather's laser. This is a pretty uh, a pretty state of the art, sophisticated laser. Produces 180 watts of light. That's one micron. It's the most stable laser in the world. Uh, it uh, uh, to operate this laser, you have to be in a clean room. In other words, no dust. Uh, so this isn't quite an Intel fab line, but it's about one level above that in terms of cleanliness. And that's why those people there are all wearing bunny suits, because even human hair and, and skin and things like that is bad for the laser. So, so we spend a lot of time making these, uh, these lasers work right. All right. Now I want to talk about the part of LIGO that I think is really the most interesting, and, and, and it's at the heart of LIGO. LIGO. The LIGO interferometer is an insubstantiation of harmonic oscillators. We use them everywhere. Harmonic oscillators are wonderful. Why are they wonderful? Because we know what the transfer function of a harmonic oscillator is, and we can use it to suppress noise. So it, remember I said the mirrors were hung. Okay, why are the mirrors hung? The mirrors are hung because you can use the transfer function of a harmonic oscillator to keep the ground motion, which is quite a bit bigger, about a factor of a trillion times bigger than what we're trying to measure, uh, uh, away from the mirrors. And, and so this is a, a picture of the harmonic oscillator frequency, and x is the motion at the bottom of here, uh, x is the, is the motion at the top. And this just basically you know, maps out the transfer function. There's a resonance here because the, the, the harmonic oscillator has a bit of dissipation, as they all do. Uh, you don't have a sharp, uh, infinite spike there, but you have a smeared out uh, resonant frequency. Uh, and then things fall off as 1 over omega squared. And I actually brought a demonstration. Um, so this is a, this is a harmonic Here, I better stay here. This is a harmonic oscillator. It actually is a spring. This spring was part of initial LIGO. All right, we actually, when we took initial LIGO apart, everybody who worked in initial LIGO got a part of it. I got a spring. Uh, so, uh, so, so I'm going to experimentally map out that transfer function. And it really, for me, at least, it visually comes home as to why, why you could make LIGO work. So I'm going to basically do what I call a swept sign measurement. All right, and the swept sign measurement, all right, I'm going to excite. So I'm the ground, or I'm the excitation. And this is the mirror. All right, so at low frequencies, if I move here at low frequencies, you'll notice, and you're watching the horizontal the direction. Yeah, uh, or maybe I'll just go over here. I will scream in the back so you can hear me, okay? Good, all right. So at low frequencies, you know, the, the bob, the mirror in this case, follows perfectly the motion of my arm, or my hand up here. So, that, so in other words, Every bit of motion that gets here gets transferred down to here. Now I'm going to push the frequency up a little bit. You can see that my hand is moving very little, but the, uh, the bob is moving a lot. All right? And that's the fact that there's a resonance. <coughs> and the energy is resonantly coupling into the motion. All right? 
And, and eventually, if I let it go, if I stop pumping energy into the system, the thing will stop. And the reason the thing will stop is because there's dissipation in the system. Right? But now what happens at high frequency, and this is the hardest part of the, the, the demonstration. Sometimes I get this right, sometimes I drop the, the spring, sometimes it hits somebody in the audience. <laughs> if I hit you in the audience, please forgive me. Uh, let me wrap it up here. <laughs> So let's see if I can make this work. So, so this is high frequency. And you can see, all right, yeah, the thing's spinning around, but I'm moving really fast, and this thing isn't moving at all. Right? And that's a harmonic oscillator, and that's what we do to make LIGO quiet. And here is a picture of the LIGO harmonic oscillators. This is an engineering drawing. We use not one, not two, not three, but four levels of suspensions. All right, and you can see them here, 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 and here, 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 and here. Uh, the mirrors, so the things that actually see the laser light, those are, are down here. There are reaction masses in here. And very uh, interestingly, they're, they're, we do not connect the mirrors with wires, we connect them with fibers. So optical fibers, much like you know, your, the internet uh, travels, you know, photons travel through uh, optical fibers. And the reason we do that has to do with thermal noise. There's a bit of statistical physics in here, what I call KT physics, all right, that it turns out that the dissipation in the wires and even the dissipation in the mirrors themselves is a, is a noise source for us, and we have to worry about that. So optical fibers minimize that. And it's a real engineering tour de force. I can tell you this thing is very, very precisely engineered. Uh, it's, an, it's really a remarkable uh, piece of engineering that makes this all work. Here's pictures of it. These mirrors are the best mirrors in the world, and I think I can say that with confidence in the sense that they have the most precise surface figure you can possibly measure. So they're spherical. They have a radius of curvature of about two, two kilometers or so, uh, which is not much when you think, or a lot. I mean, in terms of depth, it's not much. Uh, here's a picture of, of the fibers getting uh, welded onto the mirrors. Uh, so it's, it, again, it's a tremendous amount of technology. I can tell you that building these things is no mean feat. During the uh, construction, uh, I think we blew up three uh, fibers, and fortunately the test masses are protected, so when the fibers uh, break, the test masses, the mirrors, we call them test masses, uh, fall and, and get uh, caught, but uh, uh, it's quite delicate. And then up above there, I don't think I show a picture of it, but up above there you actually see the other level of seismic isolation, which is an active seismic isolation system. It has seismometers embedded in it. It's a two-level system. Basically, it reads out the ground motion using seismometers and then feeds back to platforms below it twice. We do that sequentially twice to take out, to basically feed back and take out the ground motion. So, so that all gets you about a factor of a trillion in, in suppression from the, the motion of the ground. Uh, here's a nice picture. I like this because this is one of the few times where you can actually show a laser that can be seen in LIGO. Uh, this is a green laser beam right here. Uh, again, you see that we're, we have to be in clean mode when we get near these optics, and, and this is the end test mass. So this is a picture at one of the end stations there. And we use this green laser to actually help us lock the interferometer. To, to keep the interferometer locked, in other words, to keep it at its operating point, uh, uh, you have to uh, read out op a lot of different signals, and you have to position these mirrors very, very precisely to small, small tiny, tiny fractions of a wavelength. All right. There's also a LIGO vacuum system, all right, and we're very proud of the vacuum system. Uh, it's probably not the world's largest. It may have been at one time, but it's, uh, it's, it's a whopper. It's got about 10,000 uh, cubic meters of volume. It's got, and it's spiral welded. The tube is spiral welded. You can see the, the rings there. It's got about 30,000 meters of spiral welds. Uh, and it's at a level of 10 to the minus 9 tor, which is a pretty, it's not an ultra high vacuum, but it's a pretty good vacuum. And that's at both observatories, all right. And then it's protected by these uh, covers here because uh, nature can be really nasty to, uh, uh, to these vacuum tubes. And, and, and unfortunately, we actually had a leak in one of these uh, tubes about four years ago. And I can tell you that finding a leak in a vacuum system <laughs> And, and, and I, was not, I was not actually involved in that work, but I, I, you know, I talked to the people who were, and it, it, was, uh, it was painstaking work, but we were able to do it. So the, the tubes are important there because they not only protect from nature, they protect from humans, too. Uh, so, so this person, unfortunately, this is at Hanford, and uh, the story goes is that this person was a, a, a Hanford patrol officer doing night patrol with his lights off. And unfortunately, this goes, we take safety very seriously, so we were, you know, we were very uh, uh, 
uh, concerned and proactive after the fact here. It turns out that he hadn't updated his map that showed that there was a big observatory in between him <laughs> and where he was going. Uh, so anyway, I think he's okay now. All right. Uh, all right, so you put it all together, and this is a graph that, that I'm personally, and I think the people that work on the instrument, very, very proud of. Uh, it takes a little bit of explaining. So uh, on the x-axis is frequency, linear frequency in hertz, so uh, 10 hertz to a kilohertz, maybe up to about 4 or 5 kilohertz. And on the y-axis is, is our sensitivity. It is the measurement as a function of frequency of how well we can measure displacements. All right, and it's in units of not just meters, but meters per root hertz. In other words, it's a strain, it's an amplitude spectral density. To get the actual uh, uh, displacement out, you have to basically take that quantity, integrate it over frequency, and then take the square root. That's a quick way of explaining uh, 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 amplitude spectral densities. The point I want to make here, there are two points I want to make here. One, this number is 10 to the minus 19, if I got that right. All right, so that means that in a band from about 50 hertz to about a kilohertz, we are measuring displacements in, that, in an integrated sense, RMS displacements, better than 10 to the minus 19 meters. All right, that is one ten thousandths the diameter of a proton, roughly. So, so this is a, a hugely complicated uh, uh, and a huge uh, precise experiment. The other point I want to take, make is that uh, there are a lot of things that we don't quite understand on the interferometer yet. So if you want to ask how would we predict how well our interferometer would work, the answer is, is that we would take this blue line, add it in quadrature, but basically it, you can do, the, do it by eye, uh, with this gray line here, and that's what you'd get. And you can see that we don't quite get there. There's a region of the spectrum where we don't, don't quite get it, and we're working hard to try and understand where that is. But nevertheless, this is a pretty, uh, a pretty precise measurement, and we're quite, quite happy with uh, it. And it was capable of, of detecting gravitational waves for us. So um, another point to take home uh, is the frequency. So the frequency happens to coincide with audio frequencies. You know, audio frequencies go from about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. For my case, only go up to about 5 kilohertz, but, but maybe some of you have higher pitched hearing. Uh, and so these gravitational waves, in some sense, even though they're not sound, uh, we can represent them as sound, and you'll hear a little bit about that later. Okay, so now let's, let's go to what I think is really the payoff of all this hard work and detector building and engineering, and that's the first gravitational wave event. So we, we built advanced LIGO. It was a second-generation machine. In other words, we built an initial version of LIGO, of which that spring that I showed you came from, which was very sensitive but not sensitive enough to measure gravitational waves. And it just has to do with the rate or the predicted rate of events in the universe. So we launched in 2000 a program to measure, uh, to build an upgraded detector. We called it Advanced LIGO. That's what I just showed you, all right, with a goal of being a 10 times better. And at 10 times better, we were pretty confident, I would say very, very confident, that we would be able to detect a, a gravitational wave source. We didn't know from where. We thought it would be, at least I thought it would be from binary neutron stars. All right, so we built this thing. It took us five years. It was a pretty complicated endeavor. I, like I told you, things break. Uh, uh, vacuum leaks happen. There's all kinds of battles that you have, to, uh, you have to fight. But eventually, you get the machine working. And so we decided that we were going to start our first run. We were very proud of the fact that we were going to start our first run uh, on September 14th, all right? And then we decided that we weren't quite ready. We didn't quite have the calibration of the instrument down. There were some protocols that we didn't have in place. So we said, we're going to postpone the run. We're going to start on September 18th. But we were smart in the sense that we kept the interferometers running in what we could call science mode. So even though we didn't call it a science run, since the beginning of September, actually a little bit earlier, we were collecting data. That data was very high quality data. So we figured we'd just let it go into the can, all right? And uh, you know, if, if it's interesting data, we'll, you know, if we see something, we'll look at it. Um, well, lo and behold, nature threw us a, a, a curveball right off the bat. On September 14th, that's GWF 15, 2015, 09, September 14, threw us uh, a remarkable, amazing signal. Um, so much so that I think most of the people in the collaboration couldn't believe it. It was just too good to be true. And, and so I want to talk a little bit about that, about what it was, because what it was is, I think, equally remarkable. All right, so I'm going to show you a movie. All right, this is a movie that basically is, is created by 
actually solving those equations, those Einstein equation, that field equation that I showed you early on, on a computer for two black holes. Now, I have to step back and tell you, most of you probably know, but a black hole is, is a really interesting outgrowth consequence instantiation of general relativity in the sense that it's pure space-time. Even though there's a lot of mass in these black holes, right, the mass is manifested in itself behind that event horizon and the curvature of, of space-time goes to the infinity and in where that mass is, is located in black hole. So it's, for, for all intents and purposes, these are two, if you will, vortices in space-time that are locked together. Now, these two black holes have been orbiting around one another for probably billions of years, and it has to do with the dynamics of stellar formation and how black holes form, of which I'm not an expert, so I won't go into the, the details of that, but I will tell you that you can basically, using the waveforms that we uh, uh, we're able to recover from our instruments. We have two instruments, all right? We get waveforms from both of those instruments. You can, with some uncertainty, you can extract the parameters, the masses, all right, the, uh, uh, to some level, the distance, things like that. So, so what I'm gonna show you is a movie that shows you what we actually saw. So uh, what you're looking at, these are the two event horizons, the black holes. Uh, behind you is a star field just there for perspective, so you can see the black holes during their dance of death, as I call it. Um, the, uh, the reason the field is distorted is because of the gravitational wells that are created by the, the black holes. Light gets bent around them. Uh, and in fact, in some places it gets focused. That's those so-called Einstein rings there. Um, you're very close to these black holes in this simulation. You're about, oh, probably a uh, thousand kilometers away, which is not where you'd want to be if you were really looking at the black holes. Uh, and, and the movie basically, uh, it took about a week's worth of computer time to generate the data that was able to use, render this visualization here. But the movie itself is sped up by about a factor of 100. So, so this whole movie takes place in about a fraction of a, a second here. And, and this is what we saw. All right, so these black holes are orbiting around one another. You're looking at them face on. All right, and the reason the star field is being distorted is because the gravitational fields are dynamically changing as the black holes orbit around. And if you pay attention to them, you'll see something interesting happening. The black holes are getting closer. The reason they're getting closer is that gravitational wave energy is being, energy is being radiated, all right, and it's taking energy away. And eventually they collide and they speed up and they get and form one big black hole. All right, and you see there's an Einstein ring around there, and there was a little bit of ripple at the end of that movie, and that ripple was the gravitational wave uh, that, that came off there. So, so this was the first time ever that anybody had ever witnessed the merger of two black holes into a bigger black hole. Uh, say something about these black holes. Uh, one was about 30 solar masses, the other was about 36 solar masses. Uh, the final black hole is 62 solar masses, again with imprecision. And of course, if you do the math, you realize that there's some energy missing. And that missing energy, which I think is about three and a little bit of change in solar masses, basically is what got converted to uh, gravitational waves uh, in the last 200 milliseconds, the last 0.2 seconds. So basically, as these two guys collided, three solar masses just went poof into, into gravitational waves. Um, Object was located about 1.3 billion light years away, again, give or take. At the time, the orbits uh, are at a point where the black holes are merging. They are moving at about half the speed of light, each one of them. So, so this is really a storm or a convulsion in space time. It's, uh, it's a unique event. Oh, and the power, actually, that's the other thing I should point out. The power, the lum lum luminosity of the, of the event was about 50 times the uh, luminosity of the entire universe during that one period. So, so these are remarkably energetic events that are very hard to see, or very hard to detect. All right, so here's the data. So, and I love the data. The data is just beautiful. And it's the reason why we can actually say with real confidence there's a whole bunch of vetting process that has to take place to understand the statistics, to understand that the machines were uh, properly operating. But the data, with a minimal amount of filtering, you can actually see the waveform in the data. And nobody who was in this, has been in this business for a long time, believed that you could do that. Uh, the data in the upper right-hand plot overlays the Livingston and the Hanford data, and you can see that they're totally consistent. And they have this very 
nice shape where the frequency sweeps up as a function of time. That's exactly what you'd predict from general relativity. In fact, the two plots uh, in the second row are what general relativity predicts for these waveforms, uh, and, and they're spot on. Um, other people, myself included, like to look at these in terms of spectrograms, so frequency versus uh, time. All right, and you can see that they have this remarkable banana-shaped uh, character, and that's exactly what you, again, what you'd predict. So, so this signal was was very, very big. How big was it? Uh, the amplitude of the stretching and compressing. So, in other words, the differential length change that we saw at the peak of the gravitational waves was about four times 10 to the minus uh, 18 uh, meters. That's a little less than 1 100th the diameter of a proton. So, so it's a remarkable thing to think about, to get your head around, that these objects that are you know, tens of solar masses that are moving at you know, fair fractions of the speed of light that collide with one another produce a signal that you can barely register. It's a little bit of a blip here on Earth. Um, all comes back to that coupling constant I showed you at the beginning. All right, now I want to play something for you. And, and this is sub, uh, Gabriela Gonzalez, who's the spokesperson of the LIGO scientific collaboration, calls it gravity's music. All right, I'm going to play for you the signal. I said it's a digitized signal, so you can basically amplify it and play it back out on a speaker, all right, of what this sounded like. So that's the sound of two black holes colliding and producing one black hole. All right, pretty, pretty amazing that you can listen to it. So, so our dream is that one day we'll have people in the control room with Bose headphones on <laughs> saying, I just heard a 100 solar mass black hole collide with a 150 solar mass black hole. I'm going to play, I'll play, okay, sure, I'll play it again. It's playing it three times, yeah. It's, and what you're seeing is the waveform on the bottom, the waveform on the bottom, the, the chirp, you know, the, the frequency on the side, and then the, the sound comes along with the frequency here. All right. Now, we were fortunate in that, you know, one of the questions that gets asked when you detect something of this magnitude, and I'll, I'll point out that when we uh, made this discovery, we... Uh, uh, we got a lot of press. We were actually quite amazed by, by the reaction from, from uh, the, not just science journalists, but journalists in general. And one of the questions that we were prepared to answer, uh, but we didn't have to, was, well, how do you know that it's real? And the first answer is, well, we saw it on two different detectors. They're completely independent. Second is we did statistics on it. The third is the signal looks exactly like general relativity. So we had a great number of answers. But, but the question that never came up, and maybe at least it was never asked of me, was, but you only saw one. How, how, you know, how confident are you that there are more of these things out there? That this, you know, statistically, this could have been a fluke. And, and, but the time we announced this, we knew that we had a second one. Uh, and, and in fact, we may have even had a third one. So during our 01 run, this shows you a map uh, in sort of time of the two, and I would say probably three black hole mergers that we saw um, uh, during uh, the first run. So the first one and the last one are the September 14th one, which was, a, like I said, a whopper in terms of its signal. Uh, the December 26th one, that's UTC, it actually came in on Christmas Day. It was a nice Christmas present for those of us in the collaboration. Uh, um, came in, uh, was not quite as loud, but statistically it was quite confident, and I haven't talked at all about the statistics. And then there was one that actually came in on October 12th that, that to use you know, sort of general parlance, walks and talks like a binary black hole merger. Statistically speaking, it wasn't as confident. So we have this standard of five sigma, right? So both the December and the September events were five sigma. This one was not quite two sigma. So we didn't feel confident calling it a, a, a certified detection, but uh, I believe that it is. So I believe that we've actually seen about three of these things. So uh, back to the sound. Now what I want to do is play the, the sound for the two confirmed events. And this time I'm not going to... I'm not going to play it through the noise stream of the data. So the, the sound you heard before was the raw data from the instrument, minimally filtered. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to f take off that data and play the numeric, what, what the underlying waveform is, the true data. And it really gives you a, a, a sense of, of uh, uh, how these things actually sound. All right, so, so this is in their natural pitch. This is December. This is the later one. That's December. 
Okay, now we're going to shift it up by 400 hertz. So, just by those sounds, you can tell that you're looking at, oops, I went too far, you're looking at black uh, binary, binary black hole mergers there. So there's a lot of information in, in that uh, thing. So, um, all right, so wh why is this exciting? Well, it's exciting because it took us 100 years to do this, really 100 years after Einstein. Uh, it took us 50 years to actually get things working right. So it's really a triumph of, of, of human spirit and tenacity. Um, but it's actually more than that in terms of astrophysics. I think some of us were surprised by what we saw. And, and I can put this in sort of raw, uh, stark, oops, went too far there, stark uh, uh, contrast. All right, so the way we know about black holes is due to what, we're, what are called low mass or high mass X-ray binaries, where you have a black hole and you have another companion star that's a, you know, a big star that basically is close enough to the black hole that the black hole is accreting matter from that star, and the accretion, of course, basically is very energetic. It spins, or these black holes are spinning, by the way. I didn't say that. They're spinning very, very rapidly. All right, the matter is spinning around, and it's producing, it's very, you know, it's undergoing lots of collisions, uh, you know, the, the hydrogen, the helium, whatever, you know, whatever is the constituents partner star is made up of, and it's producing x-rays. And so over the past 30, 40 years, uh, x-ray astronomy has basically given us uh, uh, if you will, a, 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 a zoo or a, a menagerie of stellar mass black holes that exist in our galaxy because X-ray astronomy isn't, you know, you have to be looking in our galaxy to really get these signals. And, and here are all of those. That's mass on this one. And you can see that there's, oh, I don't know, 25 of them or maybe a little bit less than that. All right, that's 30 years of X-ray astronomy. All right, in four months of LIGO astronomy, we were able to see six and maybe even nine more black holes. And we were able to show a couple of things. First of all, that the masses, this guy in particular, all right, stunned, stunned. I think astrophysicists were very surprised because no one had seen a black hole 60 solar masses before. We know there are stellar mass black holes. We know there are these supermassive black holes that exist in the center of the galaxy, our galaxy, other galaxies, probably most galaxies. But we didn't know that these particular black hole masses existed. And that tells you something about how black holes form. Uh, and we're starting to get hints that, you know, the people who think about these things deeply are starting to tell us that this, we may be able to start differentiating different formation mechanisms. Um, so uh, within four months, we increased the number of known stellar mass black holes by about 30%. All right, and we've just started running. So we're going to be seeing a lot more of these black holes as we go f forward. Um, let me, um, yeah, I'm coming close to the end here. So let me wrap up with two themes that I think are going to be very, very important in the future. All right, one is that LIGO is a new kind of astronomy, but it's a new kind of astronomy that complements other kinds of astronomy. And in addition to the two detectors that we have in Hanford and Livingston, there are a series of detectors that are operational Right now, besides us, there's a detector in Germany called GEO600 that's operating. It's a shorter detector. Uh, a detector in outside of Pisa, Italy. Uh, Virgo is under construction. Very comparable in terms of sensitivity and architecture to LIGO. There's a detector under construction in Japan, actually underground. A little more sophisticated in terms of its technology. They actually cool the mirrors to make them more quiet. Uh, it will be operating, we hope, in 2020. Virgo will be operating next year. And we've recently pushed forward a, a proposal, a joint proposal, to put a detector in India. Uh, and it's a clone of our LIGO detectors. We actually have a complete set of parts for a third LIGO detector all right, that we're going to provide to India, and India is going to build the observatory. Hopefully by 2024, uh, that'll be online. And the reason that you want all of these detectors, and particularly the reason that India is so important, has to do with how you localize events. So an interferometer turns out is a pretty lousy telescope in terms of being able to say the event came from over there or it came from over there. It's really more like a microphone, all right? But you can use time of flight 
to, with multiple detectors, to get positional information, all right? So you have a binary black hole system that goes off, or a binary neutron star that goes off. Um, by resolving the differences in the phases of the wave, that gives you a time difference, you can say something about the location. And we can do this very quickly, actually, the, 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 the events that I showed you before, we localized them, we were able to get what we call sky maps or error boxes for them in about two or three minutes, all right? Then you send them off to your telescopic buddies, all right, X-ray, uh, uh, Palomar, uh, transient factory, and they then point their telescopes, and if they see something, all right, you've learned something really, really interesting, because now you've not only seen a gravitational wave, you've seen the e and counterpart, and that will tell you a lot more. All right, and this picture just tells you who we're working with. So in addition to LIGO, uh, here there's optical, there's X-ray, gamma ray, neutrinos, radio waves, and we're all going to work as a network, all right, to try and, uh, to try and make this all come together. Um, we don't do very well. With two detectors, here's how we did for the three events that I just showed you. So if you're an astronomer, you look at that and go, I can't really point my telescope there. <laughs> Turns out they did, actually. That, 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 um, a lot of, we had 25 uh, E&M partners follow up, and, and they covered, for this one, they covered most of that sky, different telescopes pointing in different directions. Here's what happens when you just bring in one of those interferometers. So this shows the power of uh, the third, that third detector, the Virgo detector. So this is something that astronomers get very interested in. All right, I will close with the following. Just like electromagnetics, you know, the light is, is something that has a wavelength, there's a spectrum, so does gravitational waves. So what we have done in LIGO with our colleagues in Virgo is open up the high frequency part of the spectrum, all right, looking at these compact objects like colliding black holes. There's an experiment, a satellite that's planned to be launched. They just had a very successful technology test. Uh, it's called LISA, Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, that will look at lower frequency gravitational waves, ones with periods from uh, basically minutes to hours. All right, and they will look at heavier mass objects, such as intermediate mass black holes, heavy mass black holes. They can look at phase transitions in the early universe. Very, very exciting, very different physics. There's also longer wavelengths, uh, which can be probed using radio astronomy, basically by timing the residuals of pulses from pulsars, from you know, spinning neutron stars that produce radio pulses. And they will tell us about something about the merger dynamics of galaxies. And finally, all right, there are gravitational waves that were produced at the moment of the birth of the universe, in the primordial uh, universe, the Big Bang. And they manifest themselves by the way they map their polar, they are interact with the polarization of the cosmic microwave background. And if we can see those, we will be looking back to the moment of the birth of the universe. That would be very cool. All right. So, I think I will wrap up by saying that uh, this has been a, a really fun year to be a gravitational wave physicist. Um, <laughs> and there's going to be more, uh, 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 more to come. And I want to thank the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, the Virgo Collaboration, who we work closely with, and again, the National Science Foundation. And uh, thank you for, uh, for coming.